Hello, everyone. Welcome to Chess.com's lecture. This is International Master Mark Ginsberg, and I'm going to be discussing the modern Benoni today. This will be the first of several uh, November lectures from me on the modern Benoni, and it's a very rich field of study, a very complicated fighting opening choice for black. Let's look at it from the black side because it's a nice weapon when you need to win. What we're going to do is today, we're going to look at a game that occurred in the U.S. Chess League between Mesken Amanov, he's from Turkmenistan, and his opponent, also with the last name Amanov, although they're not related, and his opponent was named Zanabek Amanov, and he's from Kazakhstan. Let's start the game. Mesken was white, and by the way, uh, interestingly, he annotated this game on the Chicago Blaze blog. Uh, Mesken won this game, but we're going to seek improvements from Zanabek's point of view. The game started with d4, knight f6, c4, c5. This is the invitation to the modern Benoni. White could decline with knight f3, but current thinking is that after cd, knight takes d4, black can play e6 and reach a decent position. He can also play a fighting move instead of e6. He can also play the move e5, which is quite possible. And in that case, white can put the knight back to, for example, c2, and the game is very sharp. I just want to make you aware of the fact that if white declines with knight f3, black faces no particular difficulties. The only challenging move is to play d5, and of course black here might play the move b5 with a bengo gambit. But we're going to study uh, the modern Benoni move order, which is e6. And uh, this move has been popularized in recent times by Grandmaster Gashimov, who has achieved good results for black. White plays knight c3, which is a normal response, e, d, c, d, d6. Now the stage is set for a very sharp game. Black has uh, three queenside pawns to white's two. That suggests that black should be aiming for a queenside advance later to make a passed pawn. However, if black has a majority on the queen side, then you'll also notice that white has three pawns in the middle and black only has two. So white has a central preponderance and will be going for a central breakthrough. So the stage is set for a very sharp game. In this position, uh, Mesken played the move g3, which is one of the main moves uh, white has at his disposal. Another quite popular line is to play e4, g6, h3 to prevent pins, bishop g7, knight f3, castles, bishop d3. And this, we can call this the central strategy, where white develops towards the middle. And this, in fact, was recommended in Yermolinsky's book, The Road to Chess Improvement. Gashimov's games as black have upheld the black side, but this is a subject for a, a later discussion because, first of all, we have to do one thing at a time. And the thing we're going to do right now is Mesken's G3, which actually it starts out quietly, but it leads to a very sharp situation. Black fianchettos his bishop with G6. White puts his bishop on G2. Black follows suit. White develops. Black castles. White castles. And now on move nine, this is a very important junction point. There's a book by Korchnoi of his collected best games. And in 1962, Korchnoi faced Mikhail Tal, which was, of course, the ex-world champion. And Tal opted to put his knight on a6. This move is not effective because a white's central buildup occurs faster than black's queenside buildup. And in the Korchnoi game, Korchnoi annotated this game very instructively, and the game proceeded h3, knight c7, e4. Uh, white's already threatening to come with the pawn to e5, and the problem for black is if he ever breaks with b5, the c6 square is left very soft uh, for possible incursions later by white's knights. So after e4, 
Tall opted to hold up the central advance with knight d7. He's giving additional support against the possible break e5. But after rook e1, that puts another piece on e5. Uh, black has a very uncomfortable situation because white is going to come with the bishop to g5 to disrupt black, and black is simply behind in this race, and white uh, additionally has the strong regrouping option of knight f3 to d2 and a possible knight d2 to c4. Korchnoi won this game convincingly, and the move knight a6, which I'll go back to, fell out of favor for precisely this reason. So knight a6 is correctly uh, one of the weakest moves at black's disposal. Zonabek Aminov played a stronger move, a6, which causes the reaction from white, a4, to prevent the simple queenside expansion with b5. Now, Zanabek plays knight bd7, which is logical, and white starts the regrouping of his knight with knight d2. Black places his rook on a semi-open file, this all is making sense, and white puts his pawn on h3. He doesn't want the black knight to jump out to g4 later and then relocate to e5. So he prevents all that with h3. However, these pawns represent a small weakening in white's kingside structure. Let's see what happens now. After h3, black just prepares the queenside advance with rook b8. White goes ahead with the knight regrouping, and he attacks d6. Black plays knight e5. We should mention at this moment that black has the alternative of knight b6, which is looking awkward, because after knight a3, the knight on b6 is simply blocking a pawn that would like to move later. That indicates that the dance of the knights has the black knight on a silly place with b6, and the white knight on a silly place at a3, but white's pawn is going to advance to drive the knight away, so the dance of the knights is going to end in white's favor. The knight b6 move has been played in many games, but white, generally speaking, has scored well from this position. Zanabek played the stronger move, knight to e5. Experience has shown that white gains nothing from knight e5, rook e5, as black has free development of all his remaining pieces. Therefore, Meskan Aminov prefers the more ambitious knight a3, and what he hopes to prove is that the black knight on e5 is staring off into space without any real perspectives. That is to say, white is gearing up with a central advance of e4 and possibly f4, and when the knight is driven away from e5, then the white knight can return to c4. So if we go back to this, take a look at this position, what black play knight e5, white play knight a3, we recognize that this is an, is an extremely uh, key moment. Has black overextended, or are his well-placed pieces the prelude of a successful attack? Let's see uh, what happens. After knight a3, Zanabek plays the uh, logical knight h5, which eyes white's kingside structure, and it holds up any f4 moves because the g3 pawn might be takeable. So after knight h5, Mesken starts with the move e4, and clearly he's planning, in some combination, he's planning f4, or he's planning g4, or both. So the question is, what can black do in this position? Well, he breaks with the move f5, and now the position, we reach a uh, debated position that's been theoretically debated for decades. This position is maximally sharp, and at the same time, it's quite logical for both sides. It's a classic battle of chess ideas. White is doing what he needs to do to try to win the battle of the dancing knights, and black is doing what he needs to do to pry open the game and launch a full-out attack on white's king before white can coordinate. The uh, next moves all revolve around this theme. EF is the only way to try to make progress, and black has to play bishop f5. He, he cannot play gf because this knight over here is hanging. So he has to walk into a possible fork with g4, and we have to wonder, is g4 winning for white, or can black get some chances? This is the theoretical question. 
Meskin played G4, and he's still in his comfort zone. And clearly, Zanabek is still in his comfort zone, too, because the next moves in this U.S. Chess League game were made quickly. And indeed, theory has shown that there's no uh, deviation possible over the next few moves. For example, in this position, if black tried the rather crazy-looking bishop d3 to counterattack the rook, that move would not work out for a very simple reason that white can just grab on h5, and then black grabs on f1, and white can just take with the king. And in this, this position, black doesn't have the right pieces remaining to attack white. For example, if he plays c4, trying to gain the d3 square for his knight, white can just eat on g6. Black takes back, for example. And now white plays knight e4, and he's completely coordinated. His bishop is threatening to go to g5 next, and white is completely winning in this position. Black uh, misplayed it. The purpose of that digression was to show you that black has no choice here, after g4, there's only one move, and it's to sacrifice on g4 to go for an all-out attack on the king. White must accept with hg, and after queen h4, it looks like a, a complete fantasy variation, but it's captured the attention of theoreticians for decades, as I said, because it's both double-edged and uh, extremely uh, creative situation where white must remove another piece with gh and now we're wondering you know what is black up to well it looks like black might be planning the move knight g4 but actually white could cover the mate with bishop f4 and that would not be working out for black so the question is what does black have for the two pieces that are lost the uh, very creative answer is that black has the uh, very original move rook back to f8. This cuts out the bishop to f4 defense in the event of knight to g4 and it puts the question back on white how do you defend against knight g4? Mesgen at this point played the move h6 which he indicated on his blog site as being forced. The question we can ask is what happens if white plays another plausible looking defense f3? f3 cuts out the move knight g4 and it appears that white is up two pieces. Well, that's not correct because f3 didn't really prevent the knight jump. Black can jump with the knight and he's threatening mate. White has to take the knight off and then black occupies the bishop uh, to d4 square and white's king is in a crossfire. He must sack the queen but this is under less favorable circumstances. After CD knight e4, black trades the rook on f1, and now if bishop f1, that would, that would be bad due to queen g4. And if king f1, now black can uh, play the rook to f8, white hides the king, black gives a check on e1, white must hide here. It appears at first glance as if white has uh, four minor pieces for a queen and unclear position because the knight and the bishop guard all the entry points of the rook. However, uh, the computer engine quickly finds the problem. The problem is after rook c8 hitting the bishop, it turns out that this bishop is pinned to the rook and the uh, poor knight on a3 is just sitting by idly and, and cannot rejoin the action. So after rook to c8, uh, it turns out that black uh, actually just wins the piece on c1 by force and uh, wins the game as well because he's too active with the queen and his pass d pawn is uh, too dangerous and white's king is additionally too open. What this all means, if we go back is that the move, let's go back to the position, the move f3 is unplayable. It looked plausible, but in fact it's completely losing. And this is something for Black to remember as he's uh, heading down the main line. Mesken's h6 is in fact the only move, and then we uh, enter the main line debate. If Black proceeds now with knight to g4, which was the principal idea, that move doesn't work here because white just sacrifices the queen. 
and after black takes the queen and white takes the important bishop off, black takes back after knight e4, we've seen this before, white is completely coordinated and uh, has four minor pieces for a queen, which is more than enough. Since black has no attack, white is completely winning. So this is unplayable for black. Therefore, after white threw in the move h6, we saw that knight to g4 was a blunder, so black just puts his bishop back to h8. Zanabek was still playing fairly quickly, and Meskin also was playing quickly, even now, as he plays knight to e4, and of course that threatens the move bishop to g5. After knight e4, black has to play knight g4, which executes the primary idea of trying to mate on h2. The question is, could white make room for, with the king, maybe, with rook e1? This shows how narrow the path is, theoretically. The answer is no, he cannot do rook e1, because that is crushed by the simple bishop leap to d4, which hits f2. After hitting f2, if white defended with bishop e3, his position just collapses, because in this moment, black can check with the queen, and when the king has to go to f1, then uh, white is in this uh, nasty pin situation with knight takes, rook takes is forced, and then black takes the rook again. And at this point, suppose white played queen to e2, trying to hold on. Black just puts the bishop back to a dominating position, and um, black is too active here. White has very poor chances of survival. The h6 pawn is falling. If white's knight tried to come back to c2, the b2 pawn would be falling. It's just too nasty. The purpose of that digression was to show you that white cannot try to run with the king. The queen h2 mate threat is, of course, a mate in one, and if he cannot run with the king, he has to give up the queen. And now we're reaching the position that is completely critical. After queen takes, queen takes, white now tries to re-enter the game with this knight, the A knight, and now he has dangerous-looking knights posted on safe squares. But black has trumps of his own. Black's remaining pieces are all quite active. The bishop can spring out to d4 at some moment. The h-file might be a base of operations for black, and black might be trying to place a rook up to, let's say, f3 in some positions, and the other rook might be playing as well. The position is so sharp that it's hard to render a verdict. Let's first see what happened in the game. In this moment, Zanabek proceeded with the queenside expansion, but this move's a little dubious because after AB, AB, white gains the A file to operate against black's king. In the modern Benoni, queenside expansion is often the right idea, but this position is so concrete that we probably have an improvement there, and we do. I'll return to this position, but first let's, let's complete this game. Mesgen took on d6, and Zanabek brought his bishop to a threatening place, e5. So Zanabek is not losing yet, per se. Mesgen blocked the bishop diagonal radically, and Zanabek hopped out to a different diagonal, check, king h2, rook b6, activating the rook along the uh, sixth rank. And now Mesgen put his rook in an active position. The question is what's going on here. It turns out that black is starting to get in a little trouble, but with active play he can rescue himself as follows. He played c4 which lines up the bishop against the rook latently, so White's, white brought his rook to a safe square on c7. And this is a very tactical position, of course. And now in this position, it turns out that black has a couple of interesting moves that he didn't play. The interesting saving chance for black is a very funny move here. Black could play rook takes knight. Now, when white takes back, black could play the bishop to e5. Isn't that strange? Suppose white took that one as well, fe. 
then black can just check with the queen. And it turns out that white's going to have a very hard time getting out of the checks. That looks like a draw. So that was a possible moment when he could have saved himself. What happened instead? After rook c7, he played his rook to d8, which was a, a little passive. And at this moment, Meskin was able to activate his other bishop with bishop h3, and white started to uh, gain control of the position, and eventually black's king came under a decisive attack. So at this moment, after queen to h5, this was the moment when it started to turn. He then had this shot bishop to e3, and the bishop cannot take because of knight forking the king and queen. And so this shot was very strong, and so black uh, had to resort to queen check, and after rook f2, queen takes e3, bishop check to e6, it turns out that white developed a decisive attack based on the coordinated forces of, of the knight, bishop, and remaining rook. So uh, black lost the game. But going back, I want to go back to the critical moment that we identified, which was when Zanabek broke with b5. In this position, I think black's pretty well off, especially in a faster time control such as the U.S. Chess League or any faster club time control. Black's queen is going to be bothersome, and black's rooks and remaining bishop are quite active. It is true that the d6 pawn is under double attack by the knights, but sometimes when a player captures a pawn, it leaves a vacuum behind of squares that the other player can use usefully. The surprising move for black here, instead of b5, which was a little premature because it opened the a-file, a much better move here, if you take a look, do you have any ideas before I talk about it? A much better move for black is to play b6. b6 has the effect of creating a b6 to c5 pawn chain and anticipates that white will remove the d-pawn, but black gains extremely active play after this move. For example, let's say white takes the pawn off. If white takes the pawn off, black can just jump into the programmed active square d4 Notice how the c5 pawn usefully defends the uh, extremely active bishop. White has gained a pawn, but white faces a, a dangerous attack. I'm not sure who's better here. For example, suppose white tried to break the uh, hold on uh, the bishop. Black could trade those, and then he has a number of options. But one of the simpler ones is queen to h4, and he's threatening to gather up the h6 pawn, which in turn hits the e3 point. The position is uh, extremely unclear. I'm not sure what side I'd rather be. The white bishop is guarding the king, but unlike the game, it cannot relocate favorably to h3. So we've ruled out um, black's king being attacked. That's why the position for black is decent, because his king is not under attack, and white's king later might be, conceivably. So instead of bishop e3, let's look for white. Is there something else? Let's take a look. Well, he could put his rook up to a3, threatening some kind of lateral defense. But after rook to a3, as you might have guessed, black can jump in with the queen. Black's pieces are, are quite harassing, and that move ruled out the knight retreat because it's hanging there. So black's queen has occupied a, a very annoying spot. It's true white can fairly uh, relocate his bishop to h3, but after king h8, it's really not clear uh, what's happening. The position is double-edged and requires further investigation. Let's go back to the move b6. What else could white do? Uh, it's very, it's very interesting position. If I was guaranteed to get this position right out of the opening, I would, I would go for it, because I have a queen, my pieces are working. White can gain the d6 pawn and make a pass d pawn, but that pawn's going to be a long time coming, 
and the black rooks and queen might be able to combine favorably. Let's take another look. Let's say white takes with the pawn. We're, let's look at this one more time. Another uh, move for black, which I hadn't shown you yet, is rook to f3. This blockading move holds up many of white's ideas, and in addition, it cuts out the retreat knight c4 as the uh, e4 knight would be hanging. So after rook f3, it's a really sharp and interesting situation. White could try to trade the offending rook with rook a3, but in that case, we can trade and give white weak pawns. This c pawn is now passed, and guess what? We can pop in again to the active uh, point d4. Let's take that a little further. Let's say white tries to contest the diagonal of bishop to e3. Once again, we can play the harassing queen to h4. So in the, in the event of a trade, the h6 pawn will be falling. This position is um, extremely sharp, and I, I don't mind being black here. In the game, as you remember, Zanabek played the perhaps over-optimistic b5. Although he had uh, amazing saving chances later, White's rook uh, quickly got to the a7 point after b5, if you remember. The rook quickly arrived to a7, and black started to have to do all sorts of contortions to try to save himself. I'm suggesting that we can avoid b5 in this position and play b6, and it's true white's going to gain a pawn, but now we have both the moves bishop to d4 and the move rook to f3 first, and then maybe bishop d4. Also notice sometimes the bishop can go one move less. It can go to, sometimes it can go to e5 in certain positions. All of black's pieces are working, and the black king looks a little funny all boxed in, but remember the bishop is going to be jumping out to give the king some room, and it's really not clear what's happening. Therefore, to conclude this particular session, if we go back to the position of the queen sack, we have this position where white had just played the move h6, and then Zanabek played bishop h8, and Meskan on his blog, on the Chicago blog, was giving white um, exclamation points right and left, and suggesting that white just stands better in, in the resulting position after knight e4, knight g4, and now remember, we do have to take on g4. That's forced, if you remember, because rook e1 is completely losing to bishop to d4. That detail means white does have to sack his queen. But now, I guess, Mesken and I are disagreeing about the uh, evaluation of this position. I'm liking black. I'd like the readers to... Um, check this out as well, either by playing blitz games or longer games, or even playing against a chess engine, and um, giving me feedback about this, because I have a philosophical difference of opinion with Meskin, because I'm liking uh, Zanabek's position here, after my uh, suggested B6 move. However, it's open for debate, so I'd really like you to take a look, because the modern Benoni is a classical battle of chess ideas. There might be no right and wrong, it just might be unclear. People who like minor pieces would love white because the d6 pawn is falling and the d5 pawn will be passed, but people who like activity and attack are going to be liking black. And it gets pretty concrete here because black doesn't have that many attacking options on the other hand, the attacking options are quite dangerous. The bishop to d4 option, the rook to f3 option. We have rook f3 here. As I said, we have bishop to d4 here. The other rook can start playing. Can white coordinate and fend off the attack? I don't know. I think black's okay here, at least okay. And this is the crux of the matter. So. I need your help, chess.com listeners. I'll set up a forum page on chess.com under my account and uh, provide a space for feedback because this position is, um, although decades old, it's, it's still quite debatable. And although White won the U.S. Chess League game, 
I don't think black's worse here. So let's leave off here with this mind-boggling confusion. And in the next session, we'll be doing uh, the uh, central advance with E4 instead of G3, which occupies several chapters of Yer Malinsky's book, Road to Chess Improvement. We're going to be looking at Gashimov games to hold up Black's side of that position. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this first session on Amano Benoni, and you get a sense of how debatable and sharp it all is. So signing off for now, this is International Master Mark Ginsberg. Uh, I'll be joining you soon with another Modern Benoni segment. Mm -hmm.